introduction the judgment of the egyptian book of the dead by e a wallace budge this librivox recording is in the public domain introduction the judgment of the dead an examination of the papyri inscribed with the theban recension of the book of the dead shows that they may be divided into two classes these one those in which the chapters of coming forth by day are preceded by introductory hymns to ra and osiris and by a judgment scene and two those in which they are preceded by a simple vignette in which the god osiris is seen seated within a shrine the oldest papyri of the eighteenth dynasty lack such introductory hymns and the judgment scene which appear most often in the illuminated papyri of the last half of the eighteenth dynasty they continue in the nineteenth dynasty but frequently in a less full form in the older recensions of the book of the dead there is no attempt to describe the judgment pictorially and although it is pretty certain that every egyptian believed that he would be judged after death there is no definite statement of the fact it will be noticed that a section of chapter thirty b contains the words my heart my mother my heart my mother my heart whereby i came into being may naught stand up to oppose me at my judgment may there be no opposition to me in the presence of the sovereign princes of osiris may there be no parting of thee from me in the presence of him that keepeth the balance let there be joy of heart unto us at the weighing of words let not that which is false be uttered against me before the great god the lord of amentet here clearly we have suggested the idea of weighing the heart as the symbol of the seed of life and the source of good and evil actions and as a matter of fact the vignette of the chapter which first appears in the eighteenth dynasty represents the deceased sitting in one pan of the scales and being weighed against his heart which is placed in the other it is not easy to say exactly what belief underlies this vignette but it seems to indicate that the guardian of the scale weighed the body to see if it had carried out properly the heart's directions and that if it had done so it would counterbalance exactly the heart and the beam of the scales would be straight this testing of the body or heart or both took place in the presence of osiris on the day when words were weighed in the papyrus of ani four small vignettes accompany the negative confession which forms part of the one hundred and twenty fifth chapter and in one of these we see the heart of the deceased in one pan of the balance and a feather emblematic of right and truth that is what is straight in the other the god anubis is testing the tongue of the balance and close by stands the monster am met or eater of the dead here we have a proof that in addition to the weighing of a man's body against his heart the heart itself was weighed against right and truth and that this stage of the judgment also took place in the presence of the god osiris the judge of the dead in the eighteenth dynasty if not earlier the idea of the judgment took great hold upon the minds of the egyptians and it found expression in the large and elaborate vignette which is prefixed to the copies of the chapters of coming forth by day which were made at this period it is however impossible to say whether the large vignette is a development of that which accompanies the one hundred and twenty fifth chapter or whether each had a distinct origin when once the idea of the great judgment scene had developed itself it seems to have been felt that the deceased ought not to enter into the hall of judgment without having first uttered words of prayer and praise to the great gods ra and osiris 
to the former as the greatest of the cosmic gods and to the latter as the judge and god of the dead hence were composed the introductory hymns to ra and osiris of which several examples are known in the hymns to ra the deceased apostrophizes the glory and majesty of the one god the creator of the world and all that therein is who manifests himself to his creatures under the form of the sun and by whose heat and light men and women beasts and feathered fowl fish and creeping things trees and herbs have their being the darkness of night into which the sun disappeared when he set was personified as an enemy of the sun and the daily victory of light over darkness was hymned with gladness by his worshippers from one point of view the egyptian regarded the course of the sun as a type of his own life and day symbolized life and night death the conflict in which the sun engaged with the powers of darkness typified the struggle of the deceased with his enemies in the underworld and man hoped that he would overcome them even as the sun vanquished all who opposed his course in a fine hymn the deceased says o thou beautiful being thou dost renew thyself in thy season in the form of the disc within thy mother hathor therefore in every place every heart swelleth with joy at thy rising eternally o ra the divine man-child the heir of eternity self-begotten and self-born prince of the tuat governor of the regions of okert thou god of life thou lord of love all men live when thou shinest thou art crowned king of the gods those who are in thy following sing unto thee with joy and bow down their foreheads to the earth when they meet thee thou lord of heaven thou lord of earth thou king of right and truth thou lord of eternity thou prince of everlastingness thou sovereign of all the gods thou god of life thou creator of eternity thou maker of heaven wherein thou art firmly established the company of the gods rejoice at thy rising the earth is glad when it beholdeth thy rays the peoples that have been long dead come forth with cries of joy to see thy beauties daily the serpent fiend that is darkness hath fallen his arms are hewn off the knife hath cut asunder his joints ra liveth in unchanging and eternal law and order again in another hymn we read thou risest thou risest thou shinest thou shinest thou art crowned king of the gods thou art the lord of heaven thou art the lord of earth thou art the creator of beings celestial and of beings terrestrial thou art the one god who came into being in the beginning of time thou didst create the earth thou didst fashion man thou didst make the watery abyss of the sky thou didst form hapi that is the nile thou didst create the watery abyss and didst give life to all that therein is thou hast knit together the mountains thou hast made mankind and the beast of the field to come into being thou hast made the heavens and the earth thou art crowned prince of heaven thou art the one dowered with all sovereignty who comest forth from the sky ra is victorious o thou divine youth thou heir literally flesh and bone of everlastingness thou self-begotten one o thou who didst give thyself birth o one mighty one of myriad forms and aspects king of the world prince of anu lord of eternity and ruler of everlastingness the company of the gods rejoice when thou risest and when thou sailest across the sky thou art unknown and no tongue is worthy to declare thy likeness only thou thyself canst do this thou hearest with thine ears and thou seest with thine eyes millions of years have gone over the world i cannot tell the number of those through which thou hast passed from these passages it is clear that the egyptians believed that the god who was typified by the sun 
was eternal immortal and unknown that is invisible that he created himself and the world and the beings and things in it he was also one and alone and there was none like unto him for the gods of whom he was king only possessed certain of his attributes and characteristics it had been denied by some that his oneness or unity is the same as the unity of god almighty though i believe there is no good reason for this view but whether it be or not it is perfectly certain that when the egyptians declared that their god was one they meant exactly what the hebrews meant when they declared that jehovah was one and what the arabs meant and still mean when they cry out that allah is one at all events the one god of the egyptians possessed all the essential attributes of the christian's god in the hymns to osiris the deceased enumerates the various titles of the god and mentions his most ancient shrines osiris is declared to be the son of seb the earth god and of nut the sky goddess and as prince of gods and men to have received the crook and the whip and the dignity of his divine fathers he is the king of eternity and lord of everlastingness and his existence is for millions of years in his name osiris he is most terrible and he endureth for ever in his name unnefer though possessing the attribute of eternal which is ascribed to ra he is not self-begotten and self-born like that god ra has no offspring in the human sense of the word but osiris begot a son after his death according to one legend who succeeded to his father's throne upon earth and avenged him on set his murderer from ra the deceased asks only that he may behold him at dawn each day but from osiris he asks that his ka or double may have splendour in heaven and might upon earth and triumph in the underworld and he adds may i sail down to tatu mendes or busiris like a living soul and up to abtu abydos like a benu bird may i go in and come out without repulse at the pylons of the lords of the underworld may there be given unto me loaves of bread in the house of coolness and offerings of food in anu heliopolis and a homestead for ever in Sekhet aru with wheat and barley therefore judging by the arrangement of the papyrus of ani the papyrus of hugh nefer the papyrus of kenna and other documents of the period it seems pretty clear that the introductory hymns and the vignette of the judgment scene together formed a special section of the fine papyri of the theban recension the vignette of the judgment scene varies in detail greatly in the various papyri though the essential parts of it are always preserved the fullest form known of it is given in the papyrus of ani and may be thus described in one portion of a chamber in the domain of osiris which we may assume to be the hall of the double maat or right and truth a balance is set wherein the heart of the deceased is to be weighed the beam of the balance is suspended upon a projection from the standard made in the form of the feather which symbolizes right and truth upon the beam of the balance sits the dog-headed ape which was associated with thoth the scribe of the gods the weighing of the heart is carried out in the presence of the company of the gods which is here represented by the following members of it one ra heru kuti or ra hamarchus the great god within his boat this boat was called the bark of millions of years and there sat in it along with ra the gods kepera and tem his own forms in the morning and evening respectively two temu or tem the form of ra at eventide he was the head of the company of gods at heliopolis and is always represented in human form this fact indicates that already in the earliest times known to us he had gone through all the various stages through which gods pass and had assumed a final and definite form three shu the son of ra and hathor who lifted up the goddess nut or the sky 
from the embrace of seb the earth god he typified the light for tefnut the twin sister of shu she is depicted as a woman with the head of a lioness she typified moisture five seb the earth god the son of shu husband of nut and by her father of osiris and isis set and nephthys six nut the female counterpart of nu or the watery mass from which all the gods were evolved and upon which the bark of millions of years floated seven isis the sister wife of osiris the mother of horus son of isis she probably typified the dawn eight nephthys daughter of seb and nut sister of osiris and isis and the sister wife of set she is also said to be the mother of anubis by osiris she probably typified eventide or twilight nine horus the sun-god who is to be distinguished from horus the son of isis he is represented in human form but with the head of a hawk the hawk was the symbol of horus and the worship of that bird is probably the oldest in egypt ten hathor the goddess of that portion of the sky wherein horus the sun-god rose and set eleven hu and sa two gods who had their places in the boat of the sun at creation it will be noticed that several of the gods for example nu ptah knemu kepera set anpu apuat amsu hapi and several goddesses for example maat nit seket bast serk uachit are not here represented the explanation of this fact is that only the gods and the goddesses of the funeral company of osiris are considered to be interested in the judgment of the dead on one side of the scale we see the god anubis testing the tongue of the balance and behind him stand thoth the scribe of the gods writing down the result of the weighing and the triform beast Amit, the eater of the dead who is waiting to devour the heart of ani should it be found light in the balance on the other side of the balance are ani's luck or destiny an object called meskin which has been described as a cubit with human head it either typifies the embryo or has some connection with the birth of ani his soul in the form of a human-headed bird perched upon a pylon and behind these are the goddesses renanet and mekenet who presided over ani's birth-chamber and rearing behind these stand ani himself and his wife thu thu with heads reverently bent ani is here depicted in human form and wearing garments and ornaments similar to those which he wore upon earth it is quite clear that the body which he has in this hall of judgment cannot be the body with which he had been endowed upon earth and we are probably to understand that it is his spiritual body wearing the white robes of the beatified dead in the world beyond the grave which we see he is perfect in all his members which are endowed with the strength and power that belong to those who have risen in a spiritual or glorified body from the dead though he stands at the entrance of the hall and the weighing of the heart has not yet taken place the artist depicted him in the form in which it was always assumed the just would appear before osiris the heart having been placed in one pan of the scales and the feather symbolic of truth in the other ani utters the words which form chapter thirty b of the book of the dead wherein he prays that there may be no parting of his heart from him in the presence of the guardian of the balance this done anubis tests the tongue of the balance and finds that the beam is exactly straight and that the heart balances the feather exactly the dog-headed ape seated on the standard reports this to thoth who standing with his writing reed in hand is ready to note the result and to declare it to the gods it is interesting to observe that the heart was only required to balance the feather and not to outweigh it a fact which indicates that the pious egyptian was supposed to be able to satisfy the demands and requirements of the law and that he took his stand in the judgment and hoped 
for acquittal by virtue of the good deeds which he had done in the body the god thoth next addressed the company of the gods as follows hear ye this judgment the heart of osiris hath in very truth been weighed and his soul hath stood as a witness for him it hath been found true by trial in the great balance there hath not been found any wickedness in him he hath not wasted the offerings in the temples he hath not done harm by his deeds and he spread no evil reports about men while he was upon earth to this speech the gods reply that which cometh forth from thy mouth o thoth dwelling in kamenu is confirmed osiris the scribe ani is holy and righteous he hath not sinned neither hath he done evil against us the devourer amemet shall not be allowed to prevail over him and meat offerings and entrance into the presence of the god osiris shall be granted unto him together with a homestead for ever in second hetepu as unto the followers of horus the gods confirm the report of thoth and ani having been found just is led into the presence of osiris by horus the son of isis the words found just represent in a measure the words ma keru or ma ut keru masculine feminine which are always added after the name of the deceased in funeral texts there is no example of their application to a living person much has been written about them and many renderings have been suggested for them such as true of voice justify triumphant victorious they actually mean right ma and word keru and seem to be meant to express the belief on the part of the writer that the deceased has satisfactorily passed the ordeal of judgment and that he has attained to the state in which his commands whatever they may be will be carried out duly and effectually while horus is leading ani into the presence of his father he addresses osiris saying i have come unto thee o unnefer and i have brought thee osiris ani unto thee his heart has been found righteous coming forth from the balance and it hath not sinned against any god or goddess thoth hath weighed it according to the decree uttered unto him by the company of the gods and it is very true and righteous grant unto him cakes and ale and let him enter into the presence of osiris that is into thy presence and may he be like unto the followers of horus for ever in the last division of the judgment scene we see ani kneeling by a table of offerings placed before the shrine of the god osiris to whom he says o lord of amentet i am in thy presence there is no sin in me i have not lied wittingly nor have i done aught with a false heart grant that i may be like unto those favoured ones who are round about thee and that i may be an osiris greatly favoured of the beautiful god and beloved of the lord of the world the royal scribe indeed who loveth him ani triumphant before the god osiris it will be noticed that ani now has his hair whitened and that he wears upon his head the object which is called a cone the signification of which is unknown he has at length penetrated to the throne of osiris the lord of eternity as the words written above read and ani's petition to the god is that he may become an osiris that is to say a being endowed with a spiritual body which can never again see death or suffer corruption the answer of osiris is not given in the papyrus nor is it as far as i have seen in any papyrus where a similar petition is made but just as it is always assumed that the heart of the deceased will always balance the feather of law or right and truth so is it also assumed that the petition of the deceased will always be favourably received and that he will henceforth be free to go about in the god's domains without let or hindrance and to participate in all the occupations of the great god himself thus the judgment scene ends and this section of the papyrus in which it is found is followed by the chapters of coming forth by day 
the question naturally arises here when did the judgment in the hall of osiris take place to this no definite answer can be given for the reason that no text supplies the information needed there are no grounds so far as i see for assuming that the egyptians believed in a great general day of judgment when all the world shall be judged and the wicked shall be punished and the righteous shall be rewarded or for thinking as some have done that the mummified bodies were laid in the tomb to await a general resurrection on the contrary all the evidence seems to point to the conclusion that the judgment of each individual was thought to take place immediately after death and if this was the belief it follows that punishment or reward was allotted to the dead at once the evil heart or the heart which had failed to balance the feather symbolic of the law was given to the monster Amit to devour thus punishment consisted of instant annihilation unless we imagine that the destruction of the heart was extended over an indefinite period the difficulty of the subject is further complicated when we come to consider the use and object of the funeral ceremonies and prayers if at his death the soul of a man passed to immediate judgment what could the ceremonies and prayers of the priests avail it we know that the embalming of a body in the best and most expensive way occupied a period varying from seventy to about one hundred days and that several more days were necessary before the body was coffined and laid with the proper ceremonies in the tomb if the prayers which the priests recited and the ceremonies which they performed over it at the grave were absolutely necessary for the future well-being of its soul and if the soul could not begin its beatified existence until such prayers had been said and such ceremonies had been performed it is difficult to understand why such a lengthy process of embalmment was resorted to for during the period which elapsed between death and burial the soul must have tarried in some intermediate place in the absence of exact knowledge we can only assume that certain prayers were said for the benefit of the deceased immediately after death and that such prayers assured his acquittal in the hall of osiris and procured for him entrance into the abode of the blessed this done the embalmment of the body might be carried out at the convenience of all concerned and the elaborate and formal ceremonies connected with the sepulture of the great would follow in due course the beliefs which are connected with the judgment of the dead are so numerous and so conflicting and belong to so many various periods of development of religious thought in egypt that it is impossible to harmonize them as new texts are discovered the difficulties will probably disappear one by one and the future labours of egyptologists will clear up many obscure passages which up to the present have been misunderstood end of introduction the judgment introduction the elysian fields of the egyptian book of the dead by e a wallace budge this librivox recording is in the public domain the elysian fields of heaven at a very early period in their history the egyptians believed in the existence of a place wherein the blessed dead led a life of happiness the characteristics of which much resemble those of the life which he had led upon earth these characteristics are so similar that it is hard to believe that in the early times the one life was not held to be a mere continuation of the other at all events the delights and pleasures of this world were believed to be forthcoming in the next and a life there in a state of happiness which depended absolutely upon material things was contemplated such ideas date from the time when the egyptians were in a semi-savage state and the preservation of them is probably due to their extreme conservatism in all matters connected with religion the remarkable point about them is their persistence for they occur in texts which belong to periods when it was impossible for the egyptians to have 
attached any serious importance to them and some of the coarsest ideas are in places mingled with the expression of lofty spiritual conceptions in a passage in the text of eunus it is said of this king eunus hath come to his pools which are on both sides of the stream of the goddess metert and to the place of verdant offerings and to the fields which are on the horizon he hath made his fields on both sides of the horizon to be verdant he hath brought the crystal to the great eye which is in the field he hath taken his seat in the horizon he riseth like sebek the son of neith he eateth with his mouth he voideth water he enjoyeth the pleasures of love and he is the begetter who carrieth away women from their husbands whenever it pleaseth him so to do and in the text of teta we read hail osiris teta horus hath granted that thoth shall bring thine enemy unto thee he hath placed thee behind him that he may not harm thee and that thou mayest make thy seat upon him and that when coming forth thou mayest sit upon him so that he may not be able to force intercourse upon thee these passages give a very clear idea of the state of egyptian morals when they were written and they indicate the indignities to which those vanquished in war both male and female were exposed at the hands of the conquerors the texts of the early period as will be seen from the extracts given further on give a large amount of information about the pleasures of the deceased in the world beyond the grave but no attempt to illustrate the employments of the blessed dead is given until the eighteenth dynasty when the vignette to the one hundred and tenth chapter of the book of the dead was inserted in papyri here we have an idea given of the conception which the egyptian formed of the place wherein he was to dwell after death a homestead or farm or country intersected with canals is at once his paradise and the home of the blessed dead and the abode of the god of his city this place is called sekhet aru or field of reeds and this name seems to indicate that the egyptian placed his paradise in the north of egypt probably in some part of the delta or in the islands of the sea still further north certain it is that the deceased prays several times that the sweet breath of the north wind may be given unto him and those who have experienced the discomfort of a south wind on a hot day in egypt will sympathize with him the fields of reeds however was but a portion of the district called sekhet hetep or sekhet hetepet or fields of peace over which there presided a number of gods and here the deceased led a life which suggests that the idea of the whole place originated with a nation of agriculturists in the coloured vignette which faces chapter one hundred and ten the scribe ani is seen being introduced to the gods of sekhet hetep by thoth who accompanies him to smooth his way and to do for him all that he did for osiris next we see him sailing in a boat laden with offerings which he is bearing to the hawk god lower down we see him reaping wheat and driving the oxen which tread out the corn and beyond that he is kneeling before two heaps of grain one red and one white in the next division he is ploughing the land of sekhet anru or sekhet aru by the side of a stream of vast length and unknown breadth and which contains neither worm nor fish in the fourth division is the abode of the god osiris and here are the places where dwell those who are nourished upon divine food and the spiritual bodies of the dead in one section of this division the deceased placed the god of his city so that even in respect of his religious observances his life might be as perfect as it was upon earth his wishes in the matter of the future life are well expressed in the following prayer let me be rewarded with thy fields o god hetep that which is thy wish shalt thou do o lord of the winds may i become a ku therein may i eat therein may i drink therein may i plough therein may i reap therein may i fight therein may i make love therein 
may my words be mighty therein may i never be in a state of servitude therein but may i have authority therein elsewhere in the same chapter the deceased addresses the gods of the various lakes and sections of the elysian fields and he states that he has bathed in the holy lake that all uncleanness has departed from him and that he has arrayed himself in the apparel of ra in his new life even amusements are provided but they are the amusements of earth for he snares feathered fowl and sails about in his boat catching worms and serpents a remarkable passage in the text of unas describes the deceased king as a soul in the form of a god who devours his fathers and mothers and mankind generally and gods he hunts and entraps the gods in the plains of the next world and having tied them securely he slays and disembowels them the choice portions of their bodies he boils and consumes at his meals at dawn eventide and midnight the remainder he burns to heat the cauldrons he eats the hearts carefully so that he may absorb the vital powers of the gods and by eating other portions also he acquires all the attributes of the god inasmuch as he has eaten the bodies of the gods he becomes indeed a god and since they possess the attribute of everlasting life and could not die again the king becomes straightway possessed of their attributes here again we have a trace of a savage custom namely that of cutting out a portion of some intestine of a foe and eating it in order to acquire his mental and physical powers such a custom must have disappeared from egypt long before the monuments known to us were made and it is hard to understand the retention of such a notion in a text filled with sublime thoughts and ideas in the texts of all periods we read often that the deceased lives with ra that he stands among the company of the gods and that he is one like unto the divine beings who dwell with them but little is told us concerning his intercourse with those whom he has known upon earth and if it were not for some two or three passages in the theban recension of the book of the dead we should be obliged to assume that the power to recognize the friends of earth in the next world was not enjoyed by the deceased but that he really possessed this power at least so far as his parents were concerned we learn from the one hundred and tenth chapter where the deceased addressing a pool or a lake situated in the first section of the elysian fields says o quenquitet i have entered into thee and i have seen thee osiris my father and i have identified my mother a delight however which he brackets with the pleasures of making love and of catching worms and serpents in the papyrus of the priestess on high we actually see the deceased lady in converse with two figures one of whom is probably her father and the other certainly her mother for above the head of the latter are written the words her mother mutes followed by the name a supplementary proof of this is afforded by a passage in the fifty-second chapter where the deceased says the god shall say unto me what manner of food wouldst thou have given unto thee and i reply let me eat my food under the sycamore tree of my lady the goddess hathor and let my times be among the divine beings who have alighted thereon let me have the power to order my own fields in tatu and my own growing crops in anu let me live upon bread made of white barley and let my ale be made from red grain and may the persons of my father and my mother be given unto me as guardians of my door and for the ordering of my territory the same idea is also expressed in the one hundred and eighty ninth chapter thus the deceased hoped to have in the next world an abundance of the material comforts which he enjoyed in this world and to meet again his own god and his father and mother as we see him frequently accompanied by his wife in several vignettes to other chapters we may assume that he would meet her again along with the children whom she bore him 
it will be noticed that little is said throughout the book of the dead about the spiritual occupations of the blessed dead and we are told nothing of the choirs of angels who hymn the deity everlastingly in the religious works of later western nations the dead who attained to everlasting life became in every respect like the divine inhabitants of heaven and they ate the same meat and drank the same drink and wore the same apparel and lived as they lived no classification of angels is mentioned and grades of them like cherubim and seraphim thrones powers dominions etc such as are found in the celestial hierarchy of semitic nations are unknown a celestial city constructed on the model described in the apocalypse is also unknown we have seen that the elysian fields much resemble the flat fertile lands intersected by large canals and streams of running water such as must always have existed and may still be seen in certain parts of the delta of the distance to be traversed by the dead before they were reached nothing whatever is said as the egyptian made his future world a counterpart of the egypt which he knew and loved and gave to it heavenly counterparts of all the sacred cities thereof he must have conceived the existence of a waterway like the nile with tributaries and branches whereon he might sail and perform his journeys according to some texts the abode of the dead was away beyond egypt to the north but according to others it might be either above or below the earth the oldest tradition of all placed it above the earth and the sky was the large flat or vaulted iron surface which formed its floor this iron surface was supported upon four pillars one at each of the cardinal points and its edges were some height above the earth to reach this iron ceiling of the earth and floor of heaven a ladder was thought to be necessary as we may see from the following passage in which pepi the king says homage to thee o ladder of the god homage to thee o ladder of set set thyself up o ladder of the god set thyself up o ladder of set set thyself up o ladder of horus whereby osiris appeared in heaven when he wrought protection for ra for it is thy son pepi and this pepi is horus and thou hast given birth to this pepi even as thou hast given birth to the god who is the lord of the ladder thou hast given unto him the ladder of the god and thou hast given unto him the ladder of set whereby this pepi hath appeared in heaven when he wrought protection for ra and in another place we read pepi goeth to his mother nut there that is in heaven and he entereth therein in his name of ladder elsewhere we are told that pepi is holy he hath received his staff he is provided with his throne and he hath taken his seat in the boat of the double company of the gods ra acteth as his pilot in his journey to the west and he establisheth his throne for him at the head of the lords of Kaz, and he hath inscribed his name at the head of the living the pe ka which is in the waters openeth its doors to this pepi and the iron which formeth the ceiling of the heavens unbolteth its gates to this pepi pepi passeth through them having his panther skin upon him and his whip in his hand a later belief placed the abode of the departed away to the west or northwest of egypt and the souls of the dead made their way thither through a gap in the mountains on the western bank of the nile near abydos a still later belief made out that the abode of the departed was a long mountainous narrow valley with a river running along it starting from the east it made its way to the north and then taking a circular direction it came back to the east in this valley there lived all manner of fearful monsters and beasts and here was the country through which the sun passed during the twelve hours of night it is impossible to reconcile all the conflicting statements concerning the abode of the dead and the egyptians themselves held different views about it at different periods the following extracts however from the pyramid texts will show the reader what views were held by them concerning the home of the blessed dead in the next world and concerning their treatment therein by the gods behold unas cometh behold unas cometh behold unas cometh forth and if unas 
cometh not of his own accord thy message having come to him shall bring him unas maketh his way to his abode and the cow goddess of the great lake boweth down before him none shall ever take away his food from the great boat and he shall not be repulsed at the white house of the great ones by the region miskent on the border of the sky behold unas hath arrived at the height of heaven and he seeth his body in the semketet boat and unas laboreth therein he hath satisfied Uureus in the mat boat and hath washed it and the hemimet beings have testified concerning him the winds and storms of heaven have strengthened him and they introduce him to ra o make the two horizons of heaven to embrace ra so that he may go forth towards the horizon o make the two horizons of heaven to embrace heru kuti harmachus so that he may go forth towards the horizon with ra o make the two horizons of heaven to embrace unas so that he may go forth towards the horizon with ra o make the two horizons of heaven to embrace unas so that he may go forth towards the horizon along with haru kuti and ra this unas is happily united to his ka his panther skin and his grain bag are upon him his whip and his, is in his hand his sceptre is in his grasp they bring to him the four khus who dwell in the hair of horus who stand on the east side of heaven and are glorious by reason of their sceptres and they declare the fair name of unas to ra and they make him to escape from neheb kau and the soul of this unas liveth in the north of the seket aru and he saileth about in the lake of ka whilst this unas saileth towards the east side of the horizon whilst he saileth saileth towards the east side of heaven his sister the star septet giveth him birth in the tuat thou hast thy heart osiris thou hast thy legs osiris thou hast thine arms osiris and unas himself hath his heart and unas himself hath his legs and unas himself hath his arms he hath walked with his legs towards heaven he hath come forth with them into heaven and his mouth declareth itself by the great dew unas flieth like a feathered fowl he hovereth and alighteth like a beetle he flieth like a feathered fowl and alighteth like a beetle upon the empty seat which is in thy boat o ra kindle the fire in order that the flame may rise up and throw incense upon it in order that the smell of incense may rise up thy scent cometh towards unas incense thy scent cometh toward unas incense your scent cometh towards this unas and the scent of unas cometh towards you o ye gods unas is with you and you are with unas o ye gods unas liveth with you and you live with unas o ye gods love ye unas o ye gods love him o ye gods come o part of ra come o matter which cometh forth from the thighs of horus come o ye who have come forth come o ye who have come forth come o ye who are feeble come o ye who are feeble come shu come shu come shu for unas cometh forth upon the thighs of isis for unas is feeble o ye gods upon the thighs of nephthys and he hath been ejected from the womb he who setteth up the ladder for osiris is ra and he who setteth up the ladder is horus for his father osiris when he goeth forth to his soul ra is on one side and horus is on the other and unas is between them being indeed the god of holy dwelling-places coming forth from the sanctuary unas standeth up and is horus unas sitteth down and is set ra receiveth him soul in heaven and body in earth those who are happy and who see unas those who are content and who contemplate unas are the gods if this god come forth towards heaven unas also shall come forth towards heaven and he shall have his souls upon him and his book shall be upon both sides of him and his inscribed amulets shall be upon his feet and the god seb shall do for him what hath been done for himself the divine souls of the city of pe and the divine souls of the city of nekon shall come unto him along with the gods of heaven and the gods of the earth and they shall lift unas up upon their hands come forth then unas to heaven and enter therein thy name of ladder 
heaven hath been given unto unas and earth hath been given unto him this is the decree which tem hath issued to seb and the domains of horus and the domains of set and the second aru with their harvests adore thee in thy name of khonsu sept teta hath not hunger like shu teta hath not thirst like tefnut for hapi talmatutef queb senef and amset that is the four children of horus destroy the hunger which is in the belly of teta and this thirst which is upon the lips of teta the hunger of teta is with shu the thirst of teta is with tefnut teta liveth upon the daily bread which cometh in its season he liveth upon that upon which shu liveth and he eateth that which shu eateth filth is an abomination to teta and he rejecteth filthy water ye have taken teta to you o ye gods and he eateth what ye eat he drinketh that which ye drink he liveth upon that upon which ye live he sitteth down as ye sit he is mighty with the might which is yours he saileth about even as ye sail about the house of teta is a net in the second aru he hath streams of running water in second hetep the offerings of teta are with you o ye gods the water of teta is as wine even as is water to ra teta revolveth in heaven like ra and he goeth round about the sky like thoth the two doors of heaven are open for thee o teta for thou hast raised up thy head for thy bones and thou hast raised up thy bones for thy head thou hast opened the two doors of heaven thou hast drawn back the great bolts thou hast removed the seal of the great door and with a face like that of a jackal and a body like that of a fierce lion thou hast taken thy seat upon thy throne and thou criest to the khus come to me come to me come to horus who hath avenged his father for it is teta who will lead thee in thou puttest thy hand upon the earth and with thine arm thou doest battle in the great domain and thou revolvest there among the khus and thou standest up like osiris hail osiris tata horus hath come to embrace thee with his arms and he hath made thoth to drive away for thee in defeat the followers of set and he hath taken them captive on thy behalf and he hath repulsed the heart of set for he is stronger than set and now thou art come forth before him and seb hath watched thy journey and he hath set thee in thy place and hath led unto thee thy two sisters isis and nephthys horus hath united thee unto the gods and they show themselves as brothers unto thee in thy name sent and they do not repulse thee in thy name atert he hath granted that the gods shall guard thee and seb hath set his sandal upon the head of thine enemy thou hast driven back the enemy thy son horus hath smitten him and he hath torn out his own eye and given it unto thee in order that thou mayest be strong thereby and that thou mayest gain the mastery thereby among the khus horus hath permitted thee to hack thine enemy in pieces with this eye he smiteth down thine enemy with it for horus is stronger than he is and he passeth judgment upon his father who is in thee in thy name he whose father is stronger than heaven the goddess nut hath made thee to be a god unto set in thy name of god and thy mother nut hath spread out her two arms over thee in her name of coverer of heaven horus hath smitten set and he hath cast him down beneath thee and set beareth thee up and is a mighty one beneath thee inasmuch as he is the great one of the earth which he ordereth in the name of ta cha sir ta horus hath granted that set shall be judged in his heart in his house with thee and he hath granted that thou shalt smite him with thy hand when and so whensoever he doeth battle with thee hail osiris tata horus hath avenged thee and he hath caused his ka which is in thee to make thee to rest in thy name of ka hetep hail osiris tata seb hath given to thee thy two eyes that thou mayest rest in the two eyes of this great one that is osiris who is in thee seb hath made them to be given unto thee by horus that thou mayest rest upon them that isis and nephthys may see thee and that they may find thee horus hath made an offering unto thee horus hath granted that isis and nephthys may protect thee and they have handed thee over to horus that he may rest upon thee horus hath glorified thee in thy name of horizon where ra showeth himself in thy arms in the name of dweller in the palace 
thou hast made thy hand to be like a wall behind him behind him to give stability to his bones and to magnify his heart the right side of teta belongeth to horus who smiteth the techen tru in his two sceptres and nephthys in the two eyes the left side of teta belongeth to set who judgeth teta hail bolt which closeth the door of nut it is teta shu who cometh forth from tem hail nu grant that the door may be opened to teta for he cometh as a divine soul nu hath adjudged teta to tem and pekah hath adjudged teta to shu he granteth that the two doors of heaven shall be opened and he hath decreed that teta shall be among men without name but behold thou hast grasped teta by the hand and thou hast drawn him to heaven so that he may never die upon earth among men o father of teta o father of teta in the darkness o father of teta tem in the darkness thou hast brought teta near thee because he hath performed the shooting forth of flame and the making protection even as the four goddesses isis nephthys neith and serkhethetu did for the father of nu on the day of protecting the throne o road of horus extend thy sail for teta give thy hand to teta hail ra come for teta passeth to the shore even as thy followers the unka who love thee have passed thee stretch out thy hand to the west stretch out thy hand to teta stretch out thy hand to the east stretch out thy hand to teta even as thou hast done to the place where is the eldest son this teta is osiris and he hath motion this teta hath detestation of the earth and he will not enter into seb this teta hath broken for ever his sleep in his dwelling which is upon earth the bones of teta flourish and obstacles to him are are destroyed for he is purified with the eye of horus the obstacles which he encountered are beaten down by the two tichert goddesses that is isis and nephthys and teta hath cast to the earth his seed in kes the sister of this teta the lady of the city of pe bewaileth him and the two nurses who created osiris also create him teta is in heaven this teta is in heaven like shu and ra this teta perisheth not and nothing in him perisheth nay this teta is the governor of his leg of the first-born gods this teta sitteth not as the guardian of god the offerings of this teta are for horus and ra and the sepulchral offerings of this teta are in new this is teta and he goeth with ra this teta cometh with ra he hath embraced his habitations he giveth opposition and destroyeth it he gathereth the cause and delivereth them this teta watcheth and lieth down and he hath destroyed the two anuti in unu the foot of this teta departeth not and the heart of this teta is not repulsed rise up teta and lift up thy legs o most mighty one to go and seat thyself among the gods and do thou that which osiris has done in the house of the prince which is in anu thou hast received thy spiritual body sa and none shall set bounds to thy foot in heaven and none shall repulse thee on earth the khus who are the children of nut whom nephthys hath suckled have gathered together to thee thou standest up upon thy strength and thou doest that which thou must do for thy khu in the presence of all the khus thou goest to the city of pe thou art glorified and returnest thou goest to the city of nekin thou art glorified and returnest thou doest that which osiris did and behold this most mighty khu teta teta is upon his throne and standeth up being provided with all things like the goddess sam ur none shall repulse thee in any place wherein thou wouldst enter and none shall set bounds to thy foot concerning any place wherein it pleaseth thee to be hail osiris teta stand up rise up for thy mother nut hath brought thee forth and seb hath placed thy mouth for thee the great company of the gods have defended thee and they have set thine enemy beneath thee thou hast borne that which is greater than thou art through them in thy name atef mahur which is greater than thou art in thy name of ta abtu thy two sisters isis and nephthys come to thee and they make thee to pass by quent ert in thy name of quem ur and aneb uchet ert in thy name of uachmu they 
thy sister isis came to thee with thy members and thou wert united into her and thou didst give her seed and didst provide her with offspring like septet hail hail rise up tita thou hast received thy head thou hast embraced thy bones thou hast gathered together thy flesh and blood and thou goest round about the earth seeking for food thou hast received thy bread which decayeth never and thy beer which goeth bad never thou standest at the gates which drive back the wrecked kent mentef cometh forth unto thee he graspeth thee by the hand and he leadeth thee to heaven to thy father seb who is glad when he meeteth thee he giveth thee his two hands he maketh himself a brother unto thee he feedeth thee he setteth thee among the khus who never perish and the beings whose habitations are hidden make adoration unto thee rise up then o thou tata who never diest of the exudations which have fallen from the eye of horus upon the branches of the olive tree of the two horus gods who are in the temples o mighty lord of divine food in anu thou givest bread to tata and thou givest beer to tata thou makest tata to flourish thou makest his offerings to flourish and thou makest his to flourish if tata suffereth hunger the two lion gods suffer hunger if tata suffereth thirst thy mother nekebet suffereth thirst tata maketh broad the throne with seb tata lifteth on high the vault of heaven with ra tata walketh round about in seket hetep tata is the eye of ra who lieth down and is born each day homage to thee o ra in thy beauty in thy splendours in thy seats and in thy plenitude thou hast brought the milk of isis to tata and the water of the celestial stream of nephthys and power to journey over the great green sea and life and strength and health and the pleasures of love and bread and beer and apparel and everything whereon tata liveth and power to hearken to the gods who speak throughout the day and to rest with them during the night and to partake of the offerings which are made unto them tata looketh upon thee when thou goest forth in the form of thoth leading the boat of ra to the fields which are in asu and when thou goest in among those who bear him up homage to thee o tata on this thy day whereon thou standest up before ra who cometh forth from the east and who clotheth thee in thy spiritual body sa among the souls anubis governor of amenti giveth thee thousands of cakes thousands of vessels of beer thousands of vases of oil thousands of oxen thousands of changes of apparel and thousands of bulls for thee is the smen goose slain for thee is the thirp goose shot with an arrow horus hath destroyed all the evil which is in tata by his four children and set forgetteth what he wrought against tata by means of his eight fiends and those whose habitations are hidden throw open the doors to him rise thou go to the earth and seek the things which have issued from thee rise thou up and pass thou on opposite to the khus thy two wings are like those of a hawk and thy hair is like the rays of a star cast ye nothing evil upon tata neither do ye carry off the heart of tata nor steal away the place wherein it abideth hail thou pepi thou journeyest on thou art glorious thou hast gotten power like the god who is on his throne that is osiris thou hast thy soul within thy body thou hast thy power behind thee thy urarit crown is upon thy head thy head dress is upon thy shoulders thy face is in front of thee those who acclaim thee are upon both sides of thee the followers of the god are following after thee the spiritual body sahu of the god are upon both sides of thee and they make the god to come the god cometh and pepi cometh upon the throne of osiris the khu which dwelleth in the city of natat cometh the form which dwelleth in the nome of teni isis speaketh with thee and nephthys holdeth converse with thee the khus come unto thee paying homage unto thee and they bow down even to the ground at thy feet by reason of thy book o pepi in the cities of sa thou comest forth before thy mother nut and she strengtheneth thine arm and she giveth unto thee a path in the horizon to the place where ra is the doors of heaven are open for thee the gates of quebhu are unbolted for thee thou findest ra who guardeth thee and he strengtheneth for thee thy hand and he guideth thee into the northern and southern heavens and he setteth thee upon the throne of osiris hail thou pepi the eye of horus cometh unto thee and holdeth 
converse with thee thy soul which dwelleth with the gods cometh unto thee and thy form sekem which dwelleth among the khus cometh unto thee in the same way that the son avenged his father in the same way that horus avenged osiris even so shall horus avenge pepi upon his enemies and thou shalt stand there o pepi avenged and armed and provided with the forms of osiris who is upon the throne of the governor of amenti and thou shalt have thy being as he hath his among the indestructible khus and thy soul shall stand up upon thy throne provided with thy attributes and it shall have its being as thou hast thine in the presence of him who is the governor of the living according to the decree of ra the great god who shall plough the wheat and the barley and give it unto thee as a gift therein hail thou pepi it is ra who hath given unto thee all life and strength for ever along with thy speech and thy body and thou hast received the attributes of the god and thou hast become great therein before the gods who dwell on the lake hail thou pepi thy soul standeth among the gods and among the khus and the fear of thee constraineth their hearts hail pepi inasmuch as thou hast set thyself upon thy throne of the governor of the living thy book it is which worketh upon their hearts and thy name liveth upon earth and groweth old upon earth and thou shalt neither perish nor decay for ever and ever rise thou up o pepi stand thou up o thou of great strength and take thy seat at the head of the gods and do thou the things which osiris did in the house of the prince in anu heliopolis thou hast received thy spiritual body sa and thy foot shall not be restrained in heaven and thou shalt not be repulsed upon earth and behold the khus who are the children of nut to whom nephthys hath given suck have gathered themselves together unto thee and thou standest up on thy strength and thou doest that which it is thine to do in the presence of thy khu for all the khus thou journeyest to the city of pei and thou doest what must be done therein and thou returnest thou goest to the city of nekin and thou doest what must be done therein and thou returnest thou doest that which osiris did and thou art upon his throne and this khu the one most mighty standeth up armed like smai ur and wherever thou goest more shall repulse thee none shall repulse thee repulse thee and none shall set a limit to thy feet wherever it pleaseth thee to go hail osiris pepi arise stand up for thy mother nut hath given birth unto thee and seb hath arranged thy mouth for thee the great company of the gods have avenged thee and they have put thine enemies beneath thee thou hast carried that which is greater than thyself through them in thy name of ateth me ur and thou hast netted that which is greater than thyself through them in thy name of ta tani thy two sisters isis and nephthys come unto thee and they make thee to traverse kem turt and thy name of kem ur and aneb uchit urt in thy name of uach ur and verily thou art urt shent in shanur and teben shent in teben peshur he nebu shent at in shen a sekmu and isis and nephthys have protected thee in the city of sot from their master who is in thee in thy name of master of sot and from their god who is in thee in thy name of god they adore thee so that thou mayest not depart from them in thy name of morning star and they bring offerings before thee so that thou mayest not suffer pain in thy name of techen true thy sister isis hath come unto thee rejoicing in thy love and thou hast had intercourse with her and hast made her to conceive and she is heavy with septet and hero sept cometh forth from thee as heru the dweller in septet and thou doest what must be done in him in thy name of khu dweller in techentru and he avengeth thee in his name of horus the son who avengeth his father hail o cyrus pepi thou hast offered thy libation and thou hast made thy libation before horus in the name of comer forth from keb thou hast offered thine incense which maketh thee divine and thy mother nut hath made thee to be as a god to thine enemy in thy name of god thou hast offered the emanations which come forth from thee and horus hath granted that the gods which whithersoever thou goest thou hast offered the emanations which come forth from thee and horus hath granted that thou shalt judge his children wheresoever thou takest them and he decreeth for thee the renewals of youth in thy name of water of youth horus hath strength then and he judgeth his father in thee in his name of heru bat hail pepi thy journeying and thy and the journeying of thy mothers along with thee are the journeying of horus when he journeyeth forth and the journeying of his mothers who journey with him those who are with him urge him on and they lead him to the east hail thou pepi thine arms are 
ua pau and thy face is ab uat hail thou pepi a royal oblation thou seatest thyself in the regions of horus and thou goest about through the regions of set thou seatest thyself upon the iron throne and thou art judge at the head of the great company of the gods who dwell in anu hail thou pepi kent an marti or mat mati guardeth thee whilst thou guardest thy calves hail pepi ar guardeth thee against the khus hail pepi know that thou shalt receive for thine holy oblation which thou offerest each day thousands of cakes thousands of vessels of ale thousands of oxen thousands of feathered fowl thousands of sweet things and thousands of linen garments hail pepi thou hast thy water thou hast thine abundance thou hast the purifying gums which are brought to thee before thy brother nekek o osiris pepi thou risest as king of the south and of the north by reason of thy power over the gods and their cause that is doubles and behold do thou o nut spread thyself over thy son osiris pepi and protect him and deliver him from set come o nut and protect thy son for thou must protect this mighty one o nut cast thyself over thy son osiris pepi and protect him o great wife of this mighty one who is among thy children the god seb hath come unto thee o nut and thou didst possess strength and thou didst gain power in the womb of thy mother tefnut when as yet thou wert not born o oh, do thou unite life and strength unto pepi so that he may not die thou didst make strong thy heart and didst spring forth from the womb of thy mother in thy name of nut o oh, thou daughter who didst gain the mastery over thy mother and didst make herself to rise as queen of the north protect thou this pepi who is within thy womb that he may not die for me o oh, nut to whom thou hast given birth proclaim the name of osiris pepi through horus beloved of the two lands pepi the king of the north and of the south pepi the lord of the diadems of the vulture and of the uraeus beloved from the womb pepi the triple hawk of gold pepi the flesh and bone of seb by whom he is beloved pepi the friend of all the gods pepi the giver of all life and stability and power and health and joy of heart like the sun living for ever thy water is thine thy flood is thine that is to say the emanations which come forth from the god the excretions which come forth from osiris thy hands are washed thine ears are opened and this form sekum doeth what hath to be done for his son thou art washed and thy ka double is washed and thy ka hath sat down and he eateth bread with thee for ever and ever inasmuch as thou hast gone and hast taken thy seat o osiris thy mouth is open before thee acclamations are upon thy hand thy nostrils are gratified with the odour of the uraeus thy legs walk to keep the feast thy teeth are and thy fingers reckon up the lakes over which thou passest like the great bull of anu and of the gnome of uachit to go to the fields of ra which he loveth rise up then o pepi and die not hail pepi arise stand up thou art pure thy ka is pure thy soul is pure thy sekum is pure thy mother cometh to thee thy mother not the mighty creatress cometh to thee and she maketh thee pure o pepi she fashioneth thee o pepi and thou hast motion o pepi and thou art pure thy ka is pure thy sekum is pure among the khus and thy soul is pure among the gods o pepi hail pepi thy bones have been presented unto thee thou hast received thy head before seven he hath destroyed the evil which belongeth to thee o pepi before ten thou hast opened the gates of heaven thou hast unbolted the doors of kabu which repulse the beings of understanding wreck it and meant acclaimeth thee mankind and memet greeteth thee and the stars which never fail stand up before thee thy winds are incense and thy north wind is a flame for thou art he who hath become mighty in the gnome teni and thou art the star that existeth by thyself and which appeareth in the cast eastern half of heaven which never groweth old and to which horus of the city of tot hath given his body hail thou established one thou most exalted one among the stars which never fail thou shalt never perish the heavens speak and the earth quaketh by reason of thy book o osiris when thou makest thine appearance hail ye cows of amutenen who have suckled amutenen go ye round about behind him and weep before him and acclaim him by word and deed for pepi who goeth forth goeth into heaven among his brethren the gods pepi is pure pepi hath taken his staff he hath provided himself with his throne and he hath taken his seat in the boat of the great and little companies of the gods ra transporteth pepi to the west and he establisheth 
the throne of pepi above the lords of cos and he writeth down pepi at the head of the living the pe ka which dwelleth in keb is opened unto this pepi and the iron which formeth the ceiling of the sky is opened unto this pepi and he passeth through onwards his panther skin is upon him and his sceptre and flail are in his hand and pepi is sound with his flesh he is happy with his name he liveth with his ka and he ra destroyeth the evil which is upon both sides of pepi he driveth away the evil which followeth him even as Ma'a-Utu, who dwelleth in sekem driveth away the evil which is upon both sides of him and doeth away with the evil which followeth him let ra be embraced in the two horizons of heaven so that he may go forth therein before herukuti harmachus let herukuti be embraced in the two horizons of heaven so that he may go forth before ra let pepi be embraced in the two horizons of heaven so that he himself may go forth before ra and before herokuti o enter into the verdant stream of the lake of ka o fill with water the fields of aru and let pepi set sail for the eastern half of heaven towards that place where the gods are brought forth wherein pepi himself may be borne along with them as herokuti for pepi is triumphant and pepi acclaimeth and the ka of pepi acclaimeth the gods and they invoke pepi and they bring to him these four gods who make their ways over the tresses of horus and who stand with their sceptres in the eastern half of heaven and they declare to ra the excellent name of pepi and they exalt the excellent name of pepi before neheb kau for pepi is triumphant and pepi acclaimeth and his ka acclaimeth the gods the sister of pepi is septet sophus and the birth of pepi is the morning star and it is he who is under the body of heaven before ra pepi is triumphant and he acclaimeth and his ka acclaimeth the gods pepi knoweth his mother and he is not unmindful of her the white crown who begetteth and who dwelleth in the city of Mekheb. she is the lady of the great house the lady of the land of union the lady of the hidden land the lady of the field of the boat the lady of the lake which bringeth offerings she decreeth the red crown she is the lady of the domains of the city of tep o mother of this pepi cry out and present the breast to him and suckle him o thou her son pepi o father the breast hath been presented unto thee and it hath suckled thee o father thou livest o father thou art little o father thou comest forth into heaven like the hawks having feathers like unto those of geese o father it is the god hetch hetch who bringeth these things to pepi o sema ur thou bull of offerings remove thy horn and let this pepi pass by inasmuch as pepi passeth through thee and inasmuch as he goeth to heaven in full life and power this pepi seeth his father this pepi seeth ra this pepi is indeed god and the envoy or angel of god pepi cometh and he is pure in seket aru this pepi goeth down to the field of kenset and the followers of horus purify him they guard carefully this pepi and they recite for him the chapter of mao and they also recite for him the chapter of coming forth in life and in power this pepi cometh forth to heaven in life and in power in the boat and in the boat of ra he, pil pil he piloteth for ra the gods thereof and they rejoice in this pepi as they rejoice when ra goeth forth from the eastern part of the sky in peace in peace this pepi cometh forth to the eastern part of heaven where the gods are born and where he himself is born as heru kuti pepi is triumphant Ma ziru and the ka of pepi is triumphant pepi maketh adoration and the ka of pepi maketh adoration the sister of this pepi is septet he is born as the morning star he goeth with you and he journeyeth with you in second aru and he draweth nigh as do you unto the field of turquoise he eateth of that of which ye eat he liveth upon that upon which ye live he putteth on apparel like unto the apparel which ye put on he anointeth himself with the sweet-smelling substances with which ye anoint yourselves he receiveth his water with you at the lake of mena of this pepi and he drinketh it out of the vessels of the khus ra hath purified heaven and horus hath purified the earth and every god who is with them purifieth this pepi for pepi adoreth the god o thou path of pepi which leadeth to the great halls testify ye concerning pepi before these two great gods for pepi is unka the son of ra who beareth the heavens upon his shoulders and who guideth the earth hail ye gods let pepi take his seat among you hail ye stars bear ye pepi upon your shoulders as ye bear ra follow ye this pepi as ye follow apuat and love ye him as ye love this pepi hath come to thee o lord of heaven this pepi hath come to thee osiris he strengtheneth 
thy face and he arrayeth thee in the garment of a god he hath purified thee in ayata he hath destroyed the members of thine enemies he hath hacked them in pieces and he hath changed himself into the being who is among those who have been hacked in pieces for horus the son of whom thou hast given birth hath not placed this pepi among the dead but among the divine gods their water is the water of this pepi their bread is the bread of this pepi their purifications are the purifications of this pepi and that which horus hath done for osiris he hath also done for this pepi heaven uttereth words the earth quaketh seb advanceth the two divine gnomes part asunder the ceremony of ploughing the earth is ended and the offering is set before pepi the living one the established one he goeth forth from heaven and goeth about over the iron sky in life and stability he saileth over it and overthroweth in his course the fortifications of shu he goeth forth to heaven upon his wings like a mighty duck which hath broken its bonds and anubis leadeth the procession which horus made in abydos when osiris was interred he goeth forth into heaven among the stars which never perish or diminish his sister is septet and his guide the morning star leadeth him to seket hetep and he seateth himself there upon his iron throne which hath lions heads and feet in the form of the hoofs of the bull semar he standeth up there in his vacant place between the two great gods and his sceptre which is in the form of a papyrus he hath with him he stretcheth out his hand over the hemen met beings and the gods come to him bending their backs in homage the two great gods watch one on each side of him and they find pepe like the great and little companies of the gods acting as the judge of words being the prince over every prince they bow down before pepe and they make offerings unto him as unto the great and little companies of the gods hail o cyrus it is not pepe who entreateth to see thee in the form in which thou art pepe hath gone down into the great green sea and thou o great green sea hast dropped thy head and bent thy back and the children of nut who come down upon thee putting their garlands upon their heads and round their necks offer the flowers which are the crowns of the pools of seket hetep to isis the great lady and the goddess who beareth the pike in akhet bringeth them and spreadeth them out as a gift before her son horus whom she suckleth at the breast so that he may traverse the earth in his two white sandals and may go to his father osiris pepi hath opened out his way among the birds he hath travelled with the lords of food he hath gone to the great lake which is in seket hetep on which the great gods alight and these great and imperishable beings give to him the tree of life whereupon they themselves whereon they themselves do live that he also may eat and live thereon take then this pepi with thee to this great country which hath become subject unto thee by the will of the gods wherein thou eatest during the night even until dawn and where thou becomest master of divine food in such wise that pepi may eat of that of which thou eatest that he may drink of that of which thou drinkest the following prayer which is found in shortened forms in graeco roman and roman periods occurs in the text of pepi the second hail great company of the gods who are in anu grant that pepi nefer ka ra may flourish and grant that his pyramid his everlasting building may flourish even as the name of temu the governor of the great company of the gods flourisheth if the name of shu the lord of the upper shrine in anu flourisheth pepi nefer ka ra shall flourish and this his pyramid his everlasting building shall flourish if the name of tefnut the lady of the lower shrine in anu is established the name of this pepi nefer ka ra shall be established and his pyramid shall be established for ever if the name of seb the soul of the earth flourisheth the name of pepi nefer ka ra shall flourish and this his pyramid shall flourish and his everlasting building shall flourish if the name of nut flourisheth in het shenth in anu the name of this pepi nefer ka ra shall flourish and this his pyramid shall flourish and this his building shall flourish for ever if the name of osiris flourisheth the nome teni the name of this pepi nefer ka ra shall flourish and this his pyramid shall flourish and this his building shall flourish for ever if the name of osiris governor of amenti flourisheth the name of this pepi nefer ka ra shall flourish and this his pyramid shall flourish and this his building shall flourish for ever if the name of set in nupt ambus flourisheth the name of pepi nefer ka ra shall flourish and this his pyramid shall flourish and this his building shall flourish for ever if the name of horus of Bahutet 
flourisheth the name of pepi nefir ka ra shall flourish and this his pyramid shall flourish and this his building shall flourish for ever if the name of ra flourisheth in the horizon the name of this pepi nefir ka ra shall flourish and this his building shall flourish for ever if the name of kent merti in sekum is established the name of this pepi nefir ka ra shall flourish and this his pyramid shall flourish and this his building shall flourish for ever if the name of uat chit who dwelleth in tep flourisheth the name of this pepi nefir ka ra shall flourish and this his pyramid shall flourish and this his building shall flourish for ever end of introduction the elysian fields introduction the magic of the book of the dead of the egyptian book of the dead by e a wallace budge this librivox recording is in the public domain introduction the magic of the book of the dead the egyptians from the earliest to the latest period of their history were addicted to the use of formulae which were thought to be able to effect results usually beyond the power of man and they accompanied such formulae with the performance of certain ceremonies the formulae consisted of the repetition of the names of gods and supernatural beings benevolent or hostile to man as the case might be and of entreaties or curses the ceremonies were of various kinds and the object of the present chapter is to describe briefly those which relate to the various sections of the book of the dead the egyptian believed that every word spoken under certain circumstances must be followed by some effect good or bad a prayer uttered by a properly qualified person or by a man ceremonially pure in the proper place and in the proper manner must necessarily be answered favourably and similarly the curses which were pronounced upon a man or beast or thing in the name of a hostile supernatural being were bound to result in harm to the object cursed it seems that this idea had its origin in the belief that the world and all that therein is came into being immediately after thoth had interpreted in words the will of the deity in respect of the creation of the world and that creation was the result of the god's command in very early times the egyptian called in the professional religious man to utter words of good omen over the dead body of his relative or friend and later the same words written upon some substance and buried with him were believed to be effectual in procuring for him the good things of the life beyond the grave in the text on the pyramid of unas is a reference to something written which the deceased was supposed to possess in the following words the bone and flesh which have no writing are wretched but behold the writing of unas is under the great seal and behold it is not under the little seal and in the text on the pyramid of pepi the first we find the words the ureus of this pepi is upon his head there is a writing on each side of him and he hath words of magical power at his two feet thus equipped the king enters heaven in the reign of cheops however we are told that his second son harutataf brought to the court a man who possessed magical powers and who was able to join the head to a decapitated body and to make the complete body live again as before when cheops ordered the head to be struck off from a prisoner that the sage might fasten it on again the sage excused himself from performing this difficult task but when a goose was brought and its head was cut off and laid on one side of the room and the body on the other he spake certain magical words whereupon the goose stood up and began to waddle and the head began to move towards it when the head had joined itself again to the body the bird stood up and cackled thus in that remote period a man claimed to be able to restore life to decapitated creatures by means of words of magical power and it seems that the belief in the efficacy of the words of thoth was already well established in the late period the mourner consoled himself by asserting that the book of the dead prepared for his dead relative or friend had been written by the fingers of the god thoth himself 
a common way to effect certain results good or evil was to employ figures made of various substances chiefly wax or amulets made of precious stones and metals in various forms both figures and amulets were inscribed with words which gave them the power to carry out the work assigned to them by those who caused them to be made it is well known that the egyptians believed that the qualities and much else including the ka of a living original could be transferred to an image thereof by means of the repetition over it of certain formulae and a good or evil act done to a statue or figure resulted in good or evil to the person whom it represented in the west car papyrus we are also told that the wife of a high egyptian official called abba honor fell in love with one of the king's followers and that she sent to him and told him of her desire subsequently the pair met in the woman's garden and they passed the day in drinking and in pleasure on the morrow the husband was told of his wife's conduct and he determined to punish both with death having sent for his ebony box bound with fine metal he made a waxen crocodile a few inches long and having recited magical formulae over it he gave it to his chief servant and told him to throw it into the water when he saw his wife's paramour going to bathe in the evening when the guilty pair had passed another day together and the young man went down to the river in the evening the chief servant cast the waxen crocodile into the water and as it was falling it turned into a huge living crocodile about twelve feet long which swallowed the young man seven days later abba anir and the king nebka went to the water where the crocodile was and abba aner ordered it to give up the young man and it came out of the water and straightway brought up the young man when the king had made some remark abba aner picked up the crocodile which at once turned into the small waxen crocodile that it was originally and when he again ordered it to devour the young man it once more became a living reptile and seizing the young man made its way to the water and disappeared with him the faithless wife was burnt the principal actors in this story are said to have flourished during the rule of the third dynasty of egypt nearly four thousand years before christ and it is a noteworthy fact that the narrative mentions the ebony and metal box and the making of a waxen crocodile in a way which seems to show that their owner was in the habit of using the box and the wax frequently about the time of the eighteenth dynasty we learn from a papyrus that a man was prosecuted in egypt for having made figures of men and women in wax by which he caused sundry and divers pains and sicknesses to the living beings whom they represented and according to pseudo callisthenes nectanebus wrought magic by means of a bowl of water some waxen figures and an ebony rod the waxen figures were made in the forms of the soldiers of the enemy who were coming against him by sea or by land and were placed upon the water in the basin by him nectanebus then arrayed himself in suitable apparel and having taken the rod in his hand began to recite certain formulae and the names of divine powers known unto him whereupon the waxen figures became animated and straightway sank to the bottom of the bowl at the same moment the hosts of the enemy were destroyed if the foe was coming by sea he placed the waxen soldiers in waxen ships and at the sound of the words of power both ships and men sank into the waves as the waxen models sank to the bottom of the sea the same informant tells us that when nectanebus wished olympias the mother of alexander the great to believe that the god ammon had visited her during the night he went forth from her presence into the plain and gathered a number of herbs which had the power of causing dreams and pressed out the juice from them 
he then fashioned a female figure in the form of olympias and inscribed the queen's name upon it and having made the model of a bed he laid the figure thereon nectanebus next lit a lamp and reciting the words of power which would compel the demons to send olympias a dream he poured out the juice of the herbs over the waxen figure and at the moment of the performance of these acts olympias dreamed that she was in the arms of the god ammon a tradition also exists to the effect that aristotle gave to alexander the great a number of waxen figures nailed down in a box which was fastened by a chain and which he ordered him never to let go out of his hand or at least out of that of one of his confidential servants the box was to go wherever alexander went and aristotle taught him to recite certain formulae over it whenever he took it up or put it down the figures in the box were intended to represent the various kinds of armed forces that alexander was likely to find opposed to him some of the models held in their hands leaden swords which were curved backwards and some had spears in their hands pointed head downwards and some had bows with cut strings all these were laid face downwards in the box when alexander was engaged in war with any nation armed with swords or spears or bows if he recited the formulae which aristotle had taught him the swords of the foe would become as lead and bend backwards the spears would become impotent in the hands of those who held them and their heads would turn to the ground and the strings of the bows would snap returning to purely egyptian sources for information concerning the use of wax figures we come to an important work consisting of several chapters which were to be recited to keep away storm clouds and thunder from the sky one chapter reads fire upon thee o apep thou enemy of ra the eye of horus prevaileth over the accursed soul and shade of apep the flame of the eye of horus gnaweth into that enemy of ra the flame of the eye of horus eateth into all the enemies of pa in death and in life the rubric belonging to the chapters orders that it shall be recited over apep written in green ink upon a piece of new papyrus and over a wax figure of apep on which his name is inscribed in green ink this figure shall then be put in the fire that the enemy of ra may be devoured when apep is put in the fire speak ye words of power and say taste thou death to thee apep get thee back retreat thou enemy of ra fall down wriggle away depart retreat i have driven thee back i have hacked thee in pieces back thou fiend an end to thee therefore have i cast fire at thee therefore have i caused thee to be destroyed therefore have i judged and condemned thee to an evil doom an end to thee an end to thee taste thou an end to thee mayest thou never rise up again an end an end to thee an end to thee taste thou and come to an end i have destroyed the enemy of ra this figure of apep shall be burnt in a grass fire and when burnt its ashes are to be mixed with excrement and thrown into a fire afterwards when thou hast thrown apep into the fire at daybreak of the festival of the six spit upon him and defile him with thy left foot thus shall be repulsed the roarings of the backward of face thou shalt do the like of this at daybreak on the festival of the fifteenth day for by means of it apep shall be repulsed and slain before the sectet boat thou shalt do the like of this when tempests rage in the eastern parts of the sky when ra sets in the land of life to prevent the arrival of red threatening clouds in the eastern quarter of the sky thou shalt do the like of this many times as a preventive against the shower the sun's disk shall shine and apep shall be overthrown in very truth elsewhere we are told that if it be wished to destroy the fiends which accompany apep we must write the names of their fathers and mothers and offspring with green paint upon new papyrus and also inscribe their names upon 
wax figures of them which shall be tied round with dark hair these figures shall be spit upon and shall be spurned with the left foot and stabbed with a stone knife the most important mention of figures in the book of the dead occurs in the sixth chapter which properly speaking forms one of the texts that accompany the scenes of the funeral chamber as exhibited in chapter one hundred and fifty one when the egyptian in very early days conceived the existence of the elysian fields it occurred to him that the agricultural labours which would have to be carried out there might entail upon himself toil and fatigue to avoid this a short chapter five was drawn up the recital of which was believed to free the deceased from doing any work in the underworld but it was felt that the work must be done by some person or thing and eventually it became the custom to bury a figure or figures of the deceased with him in his tomb so that it or they might perform whatever work fell to his share it is probable that in semi-savage times the wealthy egyptian's burial was accompanied by the slaughter of several slaves who were supposed to follow him to the next world and to minister to his wants there the figures which were buried with the dead in the later times seem to have taken the place of the slaughtered slaves to these figures the egyptian gave the name ush ab tiu a word which is commonly rendered by respondents or answerers and they are often described in modern times as the working figures of hades they are made of stone of various kinds wood faience etc i know of none earlier than the eleventh dynasty they are inscribed with a text in which the deceased says if i be called if i be adjudged to do any work whatsoever of the labours which are to be done in the underworld by a man in his turn let the judgment fall upon thee instead of upon me always in the matter of sowing the fields of filling the water-courses with water and of bringing the sands of the east to the west to this the shabti figure makes reply verily i am here and will come whithersoever thou biddest me several of the chapters of the book of the dead are followed by rubrics which give directions for the performance of certain magical ceremonies and among them may be specially mentioned the following chapter thirteen this chapter was to be recited over two rings made of ankh hum flowers one was to be laid on the right ear of the deceased and the other was to be wrapped up in a piece of bysus whereon the name of the deceased was inscribed chapter nineteen this chapter was to be recited over the divine chaplet which was laid upon the face of the deceased while incense was burnt on his behalf chapter one hundred this chapter was to be recited over a picture of the boat of the sun painted with a special ink upon a piece of new papyrus which was to be laid on the breast of the deceased who would then have power to embark in the boat of ra and to journey with the god chapter one hundred and twenty five the judgment scene was to be painted upon a tile made of earth upon which neither the pig nor any other animal had trodden and if the text of the chapter was also written upon it the deceased and his children were flourished for ever his name would never be forgotten and his place would henceforth be with the followers of osiris chapter one hundred and thirty this chapter was to be recited over a picture of the god ra wherein a figure of the deceased sitting in the bows was drawn this done the soul of the deceased would live for ever chapter one hundred and thirty three this chapter was to be recited over a faiance model of the boat of ra four cubits in length whereon the figures of the divine chiefs were painted painted figures of ra and of the ku of the deceased were to be placed in the boat 
a model of the starry heavens was also to be made and upon it the model of the boat of ra was to be moved about in imitation of the motion of the boat of the god in heaven this ceremony would cause the deceased to be received by the gods in heaven as one of themselves chapter one hundred and thirty four this chapter was to be recited over figures of a hawk ra tem shu tif nut seb nut osiris isis suti and nephthys painted on a plaque which was to be placed in a model of the boat of ra wherein the deceased was seated this ceremony would cause the deceased to travel with ra in the sky chapter one hundred and thirty six a this chapter was to be recited over a figure of the deceased seated in the boat of ra chapter one hundred and thirty seven a this chapter was to be recited over four fires fed by a special kind of cloth anointed with unguent which were to be placed in the hands of four men who had the names of the pillars of horus written upon their shoulders four clay troughs whereon incense had been sprinkled were to be filled with the milk of a white cow and the milk was to be employed in extinguishing the four fires if this chapter were recited daily for the deceased he would become like unto osiris in every respect the rubric supplies a series of texts which were to be recited one over a tet of crystal set in a plinth which was to be placed in the west wall of the tomb two over a figure of anubis set in a plinth which was to be placed in the east wall three over a brick smeared with pitch which was set on fire and then placed in the south wall and four over a brick inscribed with the figure of a palm tree which was set in the north wall chapter one hundred and forty this chapter was to be recited over an utchat or figure of the eye of horus made either of lapis lazuli or mock stone and over another made of jasper during the recital of the chapter four altars were to be lighted for ra tem and four for the utchat and four for the gods who were mentioned therein chapter one hundred and forty four the seven sections of this chapter were to be recited over a drawing of the seven arits at each of which three gods were seated by these means the deceased was prevented from being turned back at the door of any one of the seven mansions of osiris chapter one hundred and sixty two this chapter was to be recited over the figure of a cow made of fine gold which was to be placed at the neck of the deceased during the performance of this ceremony the priest is ordered to say o amen o amen who art in heaven turn thy face upon the dead body of thy son and make him sound and strong in the underworld chapter one hundred and sixty three this chapter was to be recited over a serpent having legs and wearing a disc and two horns and over two utchats having both eyes and wings chapter one hundred and sixty four this chapter was to be recited over a three-headed ithyphallic figure of mut painted upon a piece of linen and over the figures of two dwarfs painted one on each side of the goddess chapter one hundred and sixty five this chapter was to be recited over the figure of the god of the lifted hand who had a body in the form of that of a beetle besides these a number of chapters have rubrics varying in length from two to twenty lines which declare that if the deceased be acquainted with their contents or if they be inscribed upon his coffin they will enable him to attain great happiness and freedom in the world beyond the grave seven other chapters consist of texts which were written upon the amulets that were usually laid upon the mummy namely numbers thirty b eighty nine one hundred and fifty five one hundred and fifty six one hundred and fifty seven one hundred and fifty eight and one hundred and fifty nine chapter thirty b is found inscribed upon thousands of large green basalt scarabs which were usually set in a banded frame of gold and laid inside or upon the breast just over the heart it is also found inscribed upon green basalt amulets made in the form of the heart 
the object of this amulet was to preserve the heart of the deceased and to protect it from the attacks of those who were thought to steal away the hearts of the dead its use is as old as the fourth dynasty in which period the text was not cut but painted upon it chapter eighty nine which was written to ensure the union of the soul with the body in the underworld was recited over the human-headed hawk made of gold and inlaid with precious stones which was laid upon the neck of the mummy examples of this amulet have been found with a few words of the chapter inscribed upon them chapter one hundred and fifty five is found inscribed upon tets made of gold and precious stones which have been found attached to the neck of the mummy this amulet represents the tree trunk with four branches pointing to the four cardinal points which contained the dead body of osiris and it bestowed upon its possessor stability and lasting preservation chapter one hundred and fifty six is found inscribed upon several carnelian buckles which have been found attached to the neck of the mummy this amulet gave to the deceased the powers which were enshrined in the blood and power and enchantments of the goddess isis chapter one hundred and fifty seven is found inscribed upon gold vultures which have been found attached to the neck of the mummy this amulet gave the deceased the protection of the goddess isis such as she exercised on behalf of her own son horus chapter one hundred and fifty eight was inscribed upon the collar of gold which was placed on the neck of the mummy this amulet gave the deceased freedom from the bandages with which he was swathed chapter one hundred and fifty nine is found inscribed upon several mother of emerald sceptres which were attached to the neck of the mummy this amulet gave protection or strength to the deceased chapter one hundred and sixty two is found inscribed upon circular pieces of papyri laid down upon cartonnage backs commonly known as hypocephaly they were placed under the back of the head of the mummy and by this warmth similar to that which he possessed upon earth was imparted chapter one hundred and sixty six is found inscribed upon small pillows made of hematite and other substances as the ordinary pillow raised the head of the mummy from the bed of the coffin so this amulet raised the head of the deceased in the horizon and prevented it from being laid low finally figures of the gods in metal stone faience wood wax etc were attached to the mummy in order to place it under the special protection of the deities whom they represented the following are the amulets which are commonly found in egyptian tombs and their significations one thet buckle the protection of the blood power and incantation of isis two tet tree trunk stability firmness lastingness three mut mother the protection of the goddess isis who in the form of a vulture protected her son horus and bewailed her husband osiris for a sec collar freedom from the fetters of the bandages five uach sceptre green youth vigour to flourish and to renew youth six earth pillow the lifting up of the head and body seven ab heart the seat of life and source of good and evil thoughts the heart of green basalt was connected with chapter thirty b the heart of lapis lazuli with chapter twenty six the heart of mother of emerald with chapter twenty seven and the heart of carnelian with chapter twenty nine b eight ankh the object which this hieroglyphic represents is not known but it means life and symbolizes the life which the gods live nine ut chat eye of ra or horus good health safe sound protection two uchats typify the two eyes of ra and the sun and moon ten nefer a musical instrument good luck happiness joy eleven sam a tool union unity twelve kut 
the sun on the horizon the coming forth with the rising sun and the abode of the blessed dead with ra in the west thirteen hetch white crown southern or upper egypt fourteen tesher red crown northern or lower egypt fifteen shen the sun's orbit eternity sixteen user sceptre power seventeen ren a rope which enclosed the name of kings and royal persons this sign is commonly known as cartouche name the preservation of the name was considered to be of the highest importance for the blotting out of a man's name brought with it eternal death eighteen manat an instrument joy pleasure sexual pleasure happiness nineteen naha an angle protection twenty hefnu frog a new life resurrection twenty one sec hec level equilibrium straightness twenty two ket staircase steps the steps whereon ra rested in kemenu and where on osiris stands in the underworld twenty three maket ladder the ladder by which the deceased ascended into heaven twenty four tichi bowi two fingers the fingers which the god extended to the deceased to enable him to enter heaven twenty five maat feather what is straight right truth law twenty six kepur beetle the type of the self-begotten god the creator of the gods and of heaven and earth and all that therein is and the symbol of the resurrection finally mention must be made here of the great importance attached by the egyptians to the knowledge of the names of gods supernatural beings etc and it seems that the deceased who was ignorant of them must have fared badly in the underworld thus in chapter one b it is said that the deceased knoweth osiris and his names in chapter ninety nine the deceased is obliged to tell the names of every portion of the boat wherein he wishes to cross the great river in the underworld in chapter one hundred and twenty five anubis makes him declare the names of the two leaves of the door of the hall of osiris before he will let him in and even the bolts and bolt sockets and lintels and planks will not allow him to enter until the deceased has satisfied them that he knows their names entrance into the seven arits or mansions could not be obtained without a knowledge of the names of the doorkeeper watcher and herald who belong to each and similarly the pylons of the domains of osiris could not be passed through by the deceased without a declaration by him of the name of each the idea underlying all such statements is that the man who knows the name of a god could invoke and obtain help from him by calling upon him and that the hostility of a fiend could be successfully opposed by the repetition of his name the knowledge of the names of fiends and demons constituted the chief power of the magicians of olden times and the amulets of the gnostics which were inscribed with numbers of names of supernatural powers are the practical expression of the belief in the efficacy of the knowledge of names which existed in egypt from time immemorial End of introduction the magic of the book of the dead